So here we're given a reaction between lead metal and an aqueous solution. So something that should be obvious but usually isn't when you're going through the mess that is chemistry is that whatever you're given is your reactants. You can't have lead 2 plus to start in this reaction because you don't have any lead 2 plus in this problem. Two things you have is you have lead metal and you have copper 2 plus ions. So when you're writing out the potential reaction that could take place, you have to start with those two things that you start with. Okay. Now from there, the products would turn into potentially copper metal and lead 2 plus. So first thing we want to do is see, will this reaction actually take place? So to do that, we want to use these voltages here because if our voltage overall is positive, the Gibbs free energy is going to be negative and that reaction is going to proceed spontaneously. So the lead, we have backwards. We start with lead metal and end with lead 2 plus. That's the reverse of this. This is the reduction. Here we're seeing lead being oxidized. So we're going to change this to the reverse of the reaction, which is going to flip the sign. Okay, so the electrons are moving in the opposite direction now. Okay, and this one, this matches. We have copper 2 plus to start, copper metal to end. That's good. So our total voltage is plus 0.47 volts. Well, that's positive. This reaction will go. So if we were to say that uh, no reaction would take place, that would probably guide us towards the evil. Let's take a look now. So we're going to have lead metal turning into lead ions and copper ions turning into copper metal. So the first one says the mass of the metal piece increases. Well, that's not going to be true because our lead is turning into ions that are going to go into solution. So this is wrong. This is the mass is going to decrease as time goes by. Okay. The blue color of the solution becomes less intense. Well, that is true because copper 2 plus is what's giving this blue color. So as that turns into copper metal, that blue color is going to fade. So two is correct, one is not. And that leads us to B. Okay, so 42, we're looking at water electrolysis. It's basically just doing a coulometry problem. Uh, for that, we need to know something. We need to know what the reaction is. So we're looking at water being turned into oxygen gas. So we need two water molecules. We'll need four H pluses, and we'll need four electrons. And we're going to need to know that number four to be able to do the problem. Now, I recommend for this that if you can, if you're given a time, start with the time. So we're going to start with 2.0 hours and set up an incredibly long dimensional analysis. Let's go ahead and save ourselves a little bit of time here. One hour is 3,600 seconds. Alternatively, you can go from hours to minutes and minutes to seconds. And then from seconds, many people get stuck. What you want to know is that amperage is coulombs per second. So 10 amps is really saying 10.0 coulombs of charge per one second. Okay, so you have to know to use amperage as that conversion factor. The other one that you need to be able to kind of pull out of thin air is you need to know that you can change coulombs into moles of electrons using the Faraday constant. 96,500 coulombs is equivalent to one mole of electrons in charge. Okay, now we're at a basic stoichiometry problem. We're going to go four moles of electrons is one mole of oxygen. Step, we're going to go from moles to liters. They kept things nice and easy for us here, standard conditions. So 22.4, 22.7 liters. Uh, when you go ahead and multiply that all out, I believe you get 4.2. Let me double check. 4.2 liters of gas. So our answer, therefore, is A. Okay, so many of you probably get to this question and aren't really sure what's going on. So which graph best describes the radial wave function? So if we talk about radial wave functions, let's draw a couple of p orbitals here. Let's call this a py orbital and a px orbital. Okay. So these are, these are kind of poor representations. And really, if you've seen the kind of where it's the fuzzy dots that kind of get more concentrated and less concentrated, you can understand that there's a larger concentration of electron density here than there is here, 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 here. So there's two ways to describe these. One is radial and the other is angular. So in an angular sense, I'm looking for how the electron density changes or how the wave function changes as I move around in an angular sense. Okay. And in a radial sense, it's as I move away from this and kind of a cross section of this, what does my electron density look like? Okay. So what they're really getting at is a few things here. Um, one is you need to know the number of nodes. So A here has zero nodes. And nodes would be points where the electron density doesn't exist. Uh, B has a node here, so that's one node. B has two nodes. And C has one node. Okay. So really, if we know the number of nodes, we're likely to be able to figure out our answer just from that. 
Now, the number of nodes you will have depends on a couple things. So n minus 1 is equal to the number of nodes you will have. So a 2p, n is 2, 2 minus 1, we should have one node. Okay. But if you're familiar with the shape, you'll note that this is not a radial node that you're seeing. You're seeing an angular node. You're seeing at a certain angle, there's no electron density in that kind of point is right here or right here. So this, this angle, as we rotate to here, that's when we experience the node. So in the radial wave function, we're not going to see any of those nodes. And in fact, if you look a little further, um, the radial nodes are given by n minus l minus 1. That's the number of nodes, or radial nodes. So, so 2 minus, for p orbital l is 1, minus 1, we have 0 radial nodes. So at that point, then, A is our answer. Right? We don't have any other choices, but this also makes sense if you think about it. So we're looking as, as we move away from here, we start at zero electron density, but as we move away, we start to get a lot, and then we start to slim back down. And so if we kind of look at this as a cross-section in this direction, radially as we move out, we increase in electron density, and then we decrease back down. And that makes sense. Now if you could go with a 3p orbital, a little power outage interruption there. Uh, in a 3p orbital, we would have that angular, angular and radial node. So in a 3p orbital, like here's a 2p and here's a 3p, that you can't see within that picture is as you move out, there is a point where there would be no electron density within this structure. Okay, you would see that in a graphical representation, but you can't see it in a kind of containment sense. Okay, so 44, the key here, this is probably tricky, is, is, is that as you move up in energy levels, they become closer spaced. So, and, and there's a simple kind of representation of that. Uh, so the energy in a hydrogen atom is equivalent to negative 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared for each energy level. So if we plug in n equals 1 for the first energy level, we get negative 13.6 electron volts. For n equals 2, we're going to divide that by 4. So uh, 13.6 divided by 4, negative 3.4. If we divide it by 9, we get negative 1.5. If we divide it by 16, we get negative 0.85. So what you can see happening here is that really, as our energy levels go up, they become much, much closer spaced very quickly. So we kind of have n equals 1, here's n equals 2, and then all of a sudden here's n equals 3, and n equals 4, and n equals 5. And so it very rapidly converges. So going from n of 1 to 2, or 2 to 1, is going to be bigger than going from n equals 2 to n equals infinity. Right? Because 13.6 to 3.4 versus 3.4 to 0, this is a bigger jump. So really we're, we're picking between B and D here, and we're looking for the input of energy. So we want the electron to be moving up in energy levels. So we would pick D, n equals 1 to n equals 2. By the way, on that last one, all the visible transitions are, are from, uh, I think, 3, 4, 5, and 6 down to 2. Okay, um, this one, also pretty simple for manganese. We're looking at 4s2, 3d5 for the manganese metal. So for the 2 plus ion, we're going to lose 2 electrons. You do need to know that the 4s2 are going to be the ones that go, which will leave us with 3d5. So 3D, we have five orbitals, we have five electrons. Hund's rule is going to dictate that we get five unpaired electrons. So C would be our choice. And those S electrons are further out in energy, and so they get removed first. Okay, so 46, I think is a tricky question. Um, I go ahead and put a periodic table on here. We have one to three for A, um, for B, we have uh, 6 and 14, which are here. For C, we have manganese and technetium, which are here and here. And for the last one, we have zirconium and hafnium. So zirconium is right here, hafnium is right here. Okay. So, so as you're looking at this, a couple things jump out. One is, is that all of these are spaced by one energy level apart that's going to indicate that you're probably looking at energy level spacing as you go up. And so that would close into 40 and 72, okay? However, you also have um, increased effective nuclear charge over here. And 
So, you know, the alkali metals, I mean, yeah, if you get down to rubidium and cesium, their, their energy levels are closely spaced. However, they are also very large, and so sometimes that scale can negate things. So really, you're kind of, I, I would eliminate A from those choices. Uh, and that's also hesitant, because you're looking at so few electrons that can kind of vary. Um, and then and for me, I'm picking between uh, in blue here and in pink. And so I ended up going with pink. Um, and this is tricky as well. Sometimes you get some contractions here where these end up being a little smaller. Um, that, that happens it's a little more pronounced when you get into this region where you start to get the relativistic effects. So I just went ahead and went with the uh, fact that these were the biggest energy levels. Um, and so therefore their spacing should be the least, and that worked out. Uh, but you never know on a national exam like this, they'll, they'll throw things that aren't really guided towards a certain content principle. Um, this one, on the other hand, is pretty simple, which halogen has the greatest first ionization energy. The effect of nuclear charge for all intents and purposes is the same for each of these, and so therefore the fact that fluorine has its valence electrons in the lowest energy level means they are the closest to the nucleus. So if they're all pulling with about the same net amount uh, in terms of numbers of things, the ones that are closest together should win. That would be fluorine, and it does have the highest first ionization energy. Okay, this one is tricky. You probably don't spend a lot of time in this in high school um, or anywhere. So we're looking at zinc and what type of radioactive decay would we see? So what you want to do for this is you want to write out the entire isotope. So zinc is 69 and 30. And you want to kind of think, okay, do I have too many protons or too many neutrons relative to where I would normally be. So if we look up zinc's uh, atomic mass, it's 65.4, which says that isotopes are generally around 65 total nucleons. This says 69. So this probably has too many neutrons. Okay. Uh, now, if you get a really big isotope, that's generally going to be an alpha decay. Uh, but if you have too many neutrons or too many protons, that's a case where you're probably going to see either a beta decay or an electron capture or a positron emission. So let's go ahead and look at what this would turn into now if we did the various things. So let's say we took the zinc isotope and let's say we did a beta decay. So if we do a beta decay, we're going to end up producing a beta particle, and that means we're going to have 31, same number of nucleons, so we're moving up from zinc to gallium. Okay. Well, we had too many neutrons, but this is a step in the right directions because now we're looking at one more proton with, with one fewer neutron. So we've, we've decreased the problem. So this is a good choice. We like this. B would probably be a good answer. If we look at an alpha decay, we're producing a helium nucleus. Okay, well, that's going to drop this to 65 and 28. So 28 is going to be copper. So that's not unreasonable. I mean, we are approaching uh, atomic mass that's a little closer than copper, 63 point something. Uh, but I would still, I would still stick with beta at this point. Now, if we go with positron emission, okay. So in that case, we're going to produce a positively charged electron, uh, which is going to drop the number of protons and add a neutron. So then we're looking at, well, I'm sorry, this is not copper. This is copper. This should be nickel. Sorry. So anyway, uh, now we're looking at a case where we're going in the wrong direction. Now we're adding things that we don't want to. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stick with beta and pick that. Now for gamma, gamma is not going to change your numbers. Gamma is just a piece of uh, light, light wave. And so, so if you produce a gamma light wave, you're not changing your numbers, and so that would be a case where you have something that's usually involved in other radioactive decays. I wouldn't look for that as an answer on any of these. Um, this one, you're going to look for things like uranium, thorium, anything in that lead chain of alpha particles, uh, and then iodine, carbon-14, you're looking at beta, or if you have too many neutrons. If you have too many protons, you may want to go with something like positron or in electron capture. So on to number 49, here we're asked what the bond order of carbon monoxide is. Um, to do that, we want to look at the molecular orbital diagram. So I've drawn that ahead of time to kind of save a little bit of time here. So in this, we're starting with 
Uh, we're starting with carbon with 2s2, 2p2, and it's atomic, and oxygen with 2s2, 2p4, and it's atomic. The oxygen is more electronegative, so the energy levels are lower. Okay. And then we're going to instruct the molecular orbital diagram. We're going to put a bonding and an anti-bonding for combining the 2s orbitals. We're going to end up with three bonding orbitals for the p overlap, and then three anti-bonding for the p overlap. And then we just really have four electrons plus another four plus two, so we have ten electrons to fill in. We're just going to go from the bottom up. So we've got two, four, six, eight, and ten. And then the anti-bonding orbitals are here, 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 and here. So if we look at what's populated, we have eight electrons that are in the bonding. We have two that are in the anti-bonding. So if we subtract those, that's six divide that by two to get the bond order, and we get a bond order of three. Okay. Now, I'm sure many people will get this right without knowing that, because the other thing you can do is just look at the Lewis structure and say, okay, what's well, the bond order? And for most of the time, that'll work just fine. In this case, you would see that we have um, three bonds, a triple bond, and that's going to give you a bond order of three. So usually the bond order will align with that. So if you don't know how to do a molecular orbital diagram, it's a pretty decent way to guess. Um, it gets a little complicated when you get into resonance and things like that, but that will usually give you a pretty good clue as to what the answer is. Nonetheless, 3 is the correct answer. Okay, and the last one, we have a fulminate ion. So we have a carbon to a nitrogen to an oxygen. Okay, so I started off with this Lewis structure when I did it. Okay, um, and that had a negative formal charge here on the carbon. And then I tried to look for, okay, well how else could I draw this? So one of the things I could do is I could pull these electrons here, pop these up here, give me a triple bond, and then a single bond to the oxygen. Sorry, it was like two minus and a plus. And then this would be a plus one charge, minus one charge and a minus one charge. So I think that this one makes more sense than the first one I've drawn because it distributes that negative charge over two different atoms. It also puts negative charge on the highly electronegative oxygen. So let's look at our choices now. So we have nitrogen has a positive formal charge. Okay, so we have that for both that we've drawn so far, so that looks good. Nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. So really at this point, we're tending to pick one but not two. Um, so we would pick A as our choice. But let's go ahead and look. Is there a way for us to put an electron pair on the nitrogen that makes sense? So if we look at this Lewis structure, I mean, we could pull the electrons from here and put them onto here, and that would give us three bonds and a lone pair, but that will leave us short of the octet with the carbon. Carbon typically does not violate the octet in that manner, so that's probably not going to be the case. In this one, uh, we could do the same thing. We could pull the electrons from here. That would leave oxygen short. Um, and then we can also pull the electrons from here, leaving carbon short. So it looks like our best choice is to have nitrogen with a positive formal charge and not have this. So we would go with A number one only. 